Good evening, folks. This is your host, Terry Farley in Dallas, Texas. Now calling to each one of you from the eye of the storm. The eye is at the very center of a hurricane. Regardless of how powerful the hurricane, the eye at the center is calm. God's word leads us to the eye, for the Lord encourages each of us to be still and know that he is God. Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11. Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11. Thank you each and every one very much for joining me this evening. I really appreciate it. Folks, thank you again so much for joining me uh, on this podcast, this radio program, this uh, glorification of Jesus, our Savior. Tonight we shall be embarking on a consideration of the word shortly, as presented in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And I read, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Our search then tonight shall be to strive to discover something of the depths of God's usage of this term shortly. From this context, in relation to God's perspective of time within the human realm, from this opening passage, we shall plumb the depths of the understanding being revealed by John as given to him by God in Jesus through the book of Revelation. Continuing our focus from our previous excursion, which led us to the galvanizing realization, an unknown element missing from the equation of historical documentation God has provided our world and humanity of the end of all things, from the beginning, is the pregnant absence of that key perspective, namely, when shall all these things be? John testifies in verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet. Revelation 1, verses 9 and 10. Talk about a wake-up call. Again, for our perspective, the significant aspect is the shortly, as dimensioned. Strong's Concordance relays an intensive breakdown of the seemingly innocent usage of shortly, including the notation of an elliptical influence indicating the omission of a word or words related as the unsaid parentheses inserted before the onslaught of the things which must shortly come to pass, that is, the tribulation. The unspoken event resting between the now of that day to the beginning of the apocalypse being prophesied to come shortly is understood by your host as only possibly being the rapture, which shall preempt all events on earth in its wake. Peter explains the seeming contradiction of time, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Second Peter 3.8 The shortly thus understood then proceeds from an introduction by Jesus himself of the task set before John, instructing the apostle to relay the individual corporate spiritual assessments to seven churches in Asia extent in that day, before leading John to heaven for a delineation of the shortly coming tribulation. John's divinely inspired testimony of meeting Jesus, as Jesus now is, has inspired the growth of the church across the earth from that writing to this very moment, we read. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded around his chest with a golden belt, and his head and hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like a fiery flame, and his feet 
were like fine bronze when it has been fired in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars and a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead person. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the one who lives. And I was dead and behold, I am living forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you saw and the things which are and the things which are about to take place after these things. Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 19. Note for our purposes the things which are about to take place, once again bringing the reader a confirmation of the timing aspect of shortly, though two millennia have passed, emphasizing the hint of a thousand years is one day, math coinciding even with Hosea. Chapter 5, because I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a fierce strong lion to the house of Judah, I myself will tear, tear and I will go and I will carry off and there is no one who delivers. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will search for me. Come, let us return to Yahweh because it is he who is torn and he will heal us. He has struck us down and will bind us up. He will revive us after two days. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. Hosea chapter 5, verse 14 through chapter 6, verse 2. In his messaging, the seven churches, Jesus singles out one church from the seven for the special notice. The Church of Philadelphia. <clears throat> excuse me, from the Greek meaning loves as brethren, two millennia later, inspiring the name of another city in America, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, also as the city of brotherly love. The founders of America met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, when forging the Constitution of the United States. But this first group was not a city, but rather a Christian congregation which had been called Philadelphia because of their love one for another, a trait that Jesus himself had proclaimed would be the hallmark of identification of those who follow Jesus. In his words, Jesus said, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 13, 35. This reality will come to the forefront as we progress in these final days. The Church of Philadelphia exuded this quality of brotherly love to the world, and because they were able to display the primary characteristic Jesus identified as the trait that would broadcast to the world his teachings of life and promise, the Lord also bestowed upon these brethren the special promise of deliverance, along with other special gifts. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Jesus knew their works, and for that obedience he gave to them and revealed to them the open door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. He also knows their strength and their faithfulness. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Here, Jesus unveils a cryptic warning. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Satan is real and oversees his own congregation. His most prized possessions are those who claim to be Jews, but in name only. Jesus promises these counterfeits shall worship at the feet of the Church of Philadelphia. Jesus then commends this congregation for keeping the word of his patience. 
Their prize is Jesus' promise to keep them from the hour of temptation coming upon the whole world. Importance of this promise is magnified when one fully understands the word from is translated out of the Greek word ek, clarified in the English as out of. Here the reader discovers the test of the tribulation to try the whole world will not include all believers who shall be raptured, delivered out of this evil age before the tribulation begins. Galatians 1, 4. Again, so many times throughout Scripture, Jesus again urges these believers to be alert. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Jesus continues with even more divinely appointed gifts and blessings in the following verses, but we shall now return to our opening focal passage and the word shortly. We have way more time uh, pieces in this world than we can readily use. Timekeeping has been so perfected that a few years ago, a timing device was developed to break seconds down into the billionth degree, for example. Yet the appreciation of time truly factored continues to be the challenge pursued, which reminds me of an old joke and story that's fond with sailors. Two young sailors were relaxing in a seaside bar in the Bahamas one balmy spring day. New to the world of sailing, the two continued to challenge each other on points of seamanship, maneuvering for the rank of top sailor. Sailing tactics poured forth from both of them, one interrupting the other with better ways to catch the wind. The bar was empty, but for one lone aged mariner, down at the other end, quietly enjoying a repast. Tiring of the two greenhorns and their banter, the barkeep sidled down to the old-timer and asked him if he could beach these two swabbies and end the jabber. Taking in the contest flowing at the other end of the bar, the old mariner laughed and nodded agreement. You boys have got me fascinated with your discussion, he began. Figuring out the fastest way to get out of the harbor and onto the high seas. But, the old Saul continued, the more I hear, the more I see the point you're both trying to make. And, he finished, turning back to his pint, if I was in that much of a hurry, I'd take a jet. Returning to shortly, we noticed several points emerging. The first, and major point is that God himself is sending this message in the person of his son. The message is being given to the sole remaining apostle from Jesus' tutelage, his servant John, who himself is advancing quickly in age. And most importantly, the message is to and for all of Jesus' servants extent to our day, to our moment. The scope of the message widens throughout the continuation of the book of Revelation, finally encompassing the entirety of all those living and dead across the planet. Thus, the significance of this letter, once again, falls to the question of when, and a cursory glance at shortly doesn't fulfill the depth of Revelation unrecognized being made. Shortly actually combines the essence of two Greek words, the first which reveals a strong emphasis on the concept of speed, shortly speed. Thus the reader understands these multiple of prophecies are in the view of God Almighty, who is, and was, and is to come, approaching at exponential speed. Moreover, Moreover, as noted before, the word shortly combines another Greek word in its use, thus offering a tangential perspective, obligatorily necessary to note. The second essence provided, adding to the obviation of speed, 
the interlocking element of a brief space of time forward slash in haste forward slash plus quickly forward slash plus shortly forward slash plus speedily. These added emphases thus highlighting the elliptical reference hidden within the prophecy that of the imminent any moment shout of Jesus at our repeamor, the rapture, on a day that must be called today. So God, right off the bat, is superimposing the imminence of the rapture over the headline announcement that the tribulation is coming and that the rapture, therefore, is coming way faster than any of us can imagine. Four times throughout the book of tribulation, Jesus proclaims, Behold, I come quickly. Chapter 3, verse 11. Chapter 22, verses 7, 12, and 20. Four times, behold, I come quickly. In addition, in chapter 16 of Revelation, verse 15, Jesus interjects totally out of context with the surrounding verses. He breaks into the conversation. This, for each of the Bible scholars who are listening this evening, hopefully, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Revelation 16, 15. As to any possible confusion concerning the repeamor, our rapture, for those determining that Jesus is going to shout at the end of the tribulation, rather than before it begins, note Revelation chapter 19. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give him the glory, because the wedding celebration of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. And it has been granted to her that she be dressed in bright, clean, fine linen, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the banquet of the wedding, celebration of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, and also chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Notice the bride is in heaven. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Note the bride is in heaven when giving this invitation with Jesus. Further, Jesus closes the last book, declaring, The one who testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. The introduction of the depths of worldwide calamity are introduced in chapter 6 of Revelation, a day's wage being demanded for a loaf of bread. One can't help but equate that claim with the warnings now proliferating of a gallon of gas skyrocketing in price, some even suggesting gas costing north of $10 American per gallon. And that could happen in the painfully near future. This type of growing economic chaos fits well with the horrific pr pr prognostications of the approaching end times. The prophet Daniel was given an opposite yet cryptic assurance of his own well-being in the distant closing chronicle of his ministry in chapter 12, verse 13. At the opposite end of the immediate, Daniel was told not merely the distant future, but the end of all things in the distant future, but go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot, at the end of the days, Daniel 12, verse 13, thus reveals the encouragement to Daniel that not only shall his prophecies be fulfilled, but he can rest in the knowledge that he shall abide in his destiny, his lot. An assurance has already been given to Daniel, as just a few verses before, he has received an even more curious instruction concerning his prophecies. Now I myself heard, Daniel says, but I did not understand. And I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these things? And he said, go, Daniel, for the words are secret and are sealed up until the time of the end. Many will be purified and will be cleansed. 
and will be refined. But the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Confused, uh, and who wouldn't be? Daniel wonders himself at what the outcome of all of this shall be. He is told these prophecies are actually secret and even sealed and shall be sealed until the time of the end. A spiritual winnowing shall ensue where believers will be purified and cleansed and refined. Again, with great amazement, we realize that the purification process is revealed in our blessed hope. The anticipation of Jesus shout substanti- Jesus' shout substanti- substantiating the cleansing power of daily anticipating our rapia more, the rapture. And after two millennia and more, these prophecies are again now being once more revealed and even made plain to all who will seek, knock, and ask. We are now experiencing the fulfillment of prophecies proclaimed over two millennia ago, boding the future final destruction of this old world, making place for the new, which John reveals beginning in chapter 21 of Revelation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea did not exist any longer. As the saying goes, out with the old and in with the new. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Although some think Jerusalem is the bride, John is actually introduced to the bride in chapter 22, as we've already heard. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with humanity, and he will take up residence with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. Verse 3 reveals God in the person of Jesus will live with mankind, taking up residence in Jerusalem, reigning from there on his throne. John continues, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will not exist any longer, and mourning or wailing or pain will not exist any longer. The former things have passed away. Jesus will resume his ministry of caring for his own. Death will have been destroyed. Sorrow of any kind will vanish. All former realities will pass away. And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, because these words are faithful and true. Looking into the future from his seat on the throne, Jesus again reveals his intentions and purposes proclaimed millennia before in Isaiah that he is making all things new. And so shall it continue on into eternity. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one who is thirsty, I will give water from the spring of the water of life freely. Again, Jesus proclaims the victory he cried from the cross those decades before. To tell us, die. It is finished. He is the beginning and the end. Whoever is thirsty, Jesus will give water from the spring of the water of life, and he will give it freely. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Jesus' encouragement to conquer is highlighted by Paul's testimony, as it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans chapter 8, 36 and 37. Victory is in Jesus. That and he is the undefeatable good news. And where there is good news, it is always because there is also bad news. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Who has not been fearful? Who has not been unbelieving? Abominable. Murderers whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. As Paul rightly states, 
and such were some of you. Christians are sinners saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever calls upon his name shall be saved. This is God's word, not mine. The tribulation is shortly going to come upon us. But our rapture with Jesus' shout shall preempt the greatest horror show on earth. Before shortly begins, while today remains, turn now in this moment that God has given us, turn to Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus is standing at the door. He's knocking. If anyone hears his voice, he will come into them and they to him and he will sup with them. They will fellowship. They will know each other personally. These things, the Bible, are written that you, the person who is hearing this, the person who is reading this, the person who understands this, these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. You have it now. If you believe in Jesus, you've been saved. If you believe in him, call on him, draw near to him, especially now. And you will continue to believe in his name because he will bless you with revelations from, as the Apostle Paul says, from faith to faith. Faith comes from him, not from us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That faith is the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God, that faith, not of works, lest any man or any person shall boast. Well, you know, you know what I did when I, when I, no, it's Jesus, and you can trust in him. I can tell you from almost 50 years of following Jesus, it's been, it's been a, a ride greater than anything they've got at Six Flags. But I've always gotten off the ride safely, going on to the next one, because Jesus is at the center of the storm. God bless, and we'll hopefully see you next week. And that's the wrap for this evening, folks. May we all join together in prayer that each of us has a good night. And the Lord willing, until we meet next time, or until Jesus shouts and we meet in the air, or at supper, here's bidding you all, each and every one, the very best Jesus has to offer you. From the eye of the storm, this is your host, Terry Farley bidding you a good evening.